Welcome back to Rough Cut Film Review. This is the third part of my Harry Potter extravaganza. Um, so I've just been going on about how um, at the end of the second film, Hogwarts should have been closed and criminal charges should have been brought against Dumbledore and any number of other people. However, that didn't happen, so we crack on with The Prisoner of Azkaban. So this is actually directed by uh, the Mexican director, Alfonso, I'm going to have a stab, Curaron, 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 yeah, let's, let's go with that. Now, I know him because he made the a very challenging 18-rated film, which again, I'm going to have a stab, Ye Tu Mama Tambien, maybe, where it, essentially the premise of the film was two rich young Mexican men sort of do gay stuff because uh, an attractive older lady who sort of gets involved sort of chides them into it, really, um, and it, they get really awkward. Um, so it's probably been about 10 years since I've seen that. It was a challenging film, and it was remarkable in my mind that this Mexican director has been given the reins of the Harry Potter franchise um, after Chris kid-friendly Columbus. And it was exactly the sort of move that I think they really needed to make. The tone of the films obviously gets slowly darker as the films go on. But this is the first really noticeable step towards dark, more adult subject matter. With the, for example, the Dementors being really rather grown up indeed. I think that the film is also approached by the director and the cinematographer was with really old-fashioned uh, horror sensibilities in terms of the tone, the music, the classic horror style of direction. So, and cinematography, as I've said, the scene on the train with the Dementors gives us a real sense that things have moved on from the first two films. Things have, things have changed. The kids are older, the audience is older, and this film is going to go accordingly more mature with its subject matter. I think also, to me, it introduces an element of Roald Dahl sort of style humour here. So we get the horrible muggle aunt of Pam Ferris being magically inflated with with air and floating off into the sky. All that stuff is straight out of Roald Dahl for me. Immediately, we are told in this film that Harry is in grave danger, and then they really emphasise that, and we really believe it. So it's really where things kick off as the escaped Voldemort supporter, Sirius Black, He's on the lam, and he, he wants to assassinate poor old Harry. So straight away we get a sense that characters are being properly formed. Harry, Ron and Hermione are now separate characters in their own right, with their own sort of distinct personalities, which was a bit muddled before. It kind of was, but it was a bit ham-fisted. As the kids are getting older, they are developing. I mean, there were signs of improvement in the Chamber of Secrets. However... To me, Prisoner of Azkaban is the first really proper film. This is a proper film. I really enjoyed Kenneth Branagh in the second one. I thought he was brilliant. He's really replaced by Gary Oldman in terms of some of the best actors that I've ever seen in films. Um, you know, so the, the standard is is sky high. This one is really well directed. As I've said, it's much darker in tone, and it's suddenly it's a lot more interesting than the previous two. <clears throat> Um, what I like about it really is you get a real sense that the director is not making a children's film. He's making a proper film, as I've said time and time again. Very disappointing that the Mexican director, and I'm going to start calling him the Mexican director so I don't have to keep pronouncing his name. Uh, apologies. Um, I know that sounds um, pretty awful, but it just makes my life a lot easier. I was really disappointed he only made one Harry Potter film, and then he was re replaced by Mike Newell. Um, who was the chap that did Four Weddings and Donny Brusco. He's perfectly perfunctory as a director. He does a fine job. Um, however, for me, you know, he's a safe pair of hands after The Prisoner of Azkaban. I mean, they made such a bold choice with the Mexican chap. Um, you know, it would be like, for example, if Sam Mendes was now going to be replaced by Mike Newell in the Bond films, and you'd just think, all right, well, it's just a safe pair of hands. So, here we are. Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. So Mike Newell's in charge, the Mexican director. Apologies, I don't remember his name. He's out. Mike Newell, he made Four Weddings, Pushing Tin, and The Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time. Did anyone watch that? I don't know. I didn't, but I didn't like the look of it. So to be fair to Mike Newell, I'm giving him a really rough ride, but he is light years better than Chris Columbus. He's, you know, I mean, he's he's okay. He does a perfectly perfunctory job. He I'll tell you what it's like, actually. He's he's fine. It's like going to a pub and I, you know, really fancy a pint of brew dog or, you know, something. 
and I go and I think, oh god, I want a brew dog. And then it turns out that they don't have brew dog, but they do have something I quite like, but it's not what I was after, so I'll have it. And but uh, and actually, there's nothing really wrong with it. It's just I'm, I'll be a bit bitter because I think that the Mexican director, whatever his name was again, they found their man. He was the guy to to take Harry Potter and the story to its conclusion. He didn't want to do it because I think he got bored or something. So we got Mike Newell. So the opening reel of The Goblet of Fire gives us a real proper sense that Voldemort has returned and his power is grown. But at the same time, the power of our young cast is also growing and they're making a transition from child actors to actors actors something that's actually probably harder than it looks so if I think about Macaulay Culkin or Corey Feldman or Corey Haim any of these other child actors um, <clears throat> it's one where the kids you know the, the the characters start to show signs of adolescence the, the kids are starting to notice the opposite sex and the world that they're in starts to show more political complexity which is a, a very good thing the Ministry of Magic is full of deeply flawed and very scared individuals it's very bureaucratic. It reminds me an awful lot, actually, of um, France before the outbreak of the Second World War. On paper, very powerful, but actually incredibly divided, and people aren't going to lift a finger. I'm talking, of course, about Voldemort's return. So, um, it's the it's the first film also where we see Harry suffer terrible loss, um, and it's a lot bit richer for it. We know that his parents were killed when he was an infant, but actually we, we get to experience loss with Harry because at this point people watching or reading this have grown up with these characters. So if, if something happens, some bad stuff happens, then you know people are going to experience that along with Harry. So let's move on to The Order of the Phoenix, which is a very interesting film. The Ministry of Magic is by this point crippled by fear and denial, particularly Cornelius Fudge, who's the Minister of Magic. So as the possibility of Voldemort's return increases, there's an interesting split between those that accept that he's returned and those who simply want to bury their heads in the sand. Also at that point, obviously, we've got people who are Death Eaters pretending not to be. But, you know, there is a very interesting split. What really impresses me about this film and the films as they go on is that they're getting darker, but also we get increasing emotional sophistication, and I think that's crucial. So we're told by one of the characters that people are neither good nor bad, but there is good and bad in all of us, and therefore it makes you know the, the decision that you make and the character's decisions all the more uh, poignant. So, and and the, the the big character I think of when I think about this actually is this this sort of good and evil the duality of man is Draco Malfoy who you know we see him as a bully and the you know a silly school bully in the early films and a bit of a figure of fun but actually you know his family as we suspect are death eaters I mean we know that his dad tried to do away with Harry in one of the earlier films but never mind he suffers from cowardice but he's not all bad and we get a sense of that and we get a sense that he's somewhat his character is somewhat co conflicted and he's also actually very well played by the actor the action steps up a gear from the previous films here. So we see something of a duel between Harry and Voldemort at the climax. Um, but, you know, everything is starting to be ramped up and it's, it is a very enjoyable film.